So again, this morning, I want to respond to a, a few of the questions that you posed, and I want to put them under this rubric, rubric that I think is important for us to explore more in church as people of faith, as uncomfortable as it might be, under this sort of rubric of, of Christian nationalism or white Christian nationalism. And here are the questions that you pose that I want to address from this angle. Why have Christians done so many horrible things in the name of God? There are countless kings in the Bible who ruled and were always fighting with others. Why, if they were all following God? Why did they turn on occasion to worship false gods? Why is there constant fighting in the Middle East? And how do we maintain and strengthen our religious freedoms given our current and future political climate? So I chose our scripture readings this morning as the place that I want to begin my response to these questions with the gospel of Matthew. Then and now, to say, blessed are the poor, the, the Greek word that's actually used there could be translated a few ways, but it really has this connotation of being favored. Favored are those, Jesus says, who are poor, who mourn, who hunger and thirst for justice. Favored are those who, in essence, struggle to make ends meet, to put food on their table, to pay their medical bills. Favored are those who weep in grief and mourn in the face of injustice. Favored are those living with the challenges and stigmas of mental health and disabilities. So for Jesus to say that these are the favored ones of God was to make a, a certain kind of political statement and that this view, this vision for the world as those who are favored, blessed by God, is countercultural to, to the one that currently rules our world and our common assumptions about who is blessed, who is favored. And to say that these are the favored ones of God is for Jesus to suggest that those he was preaching to, they are not forgotten. That their lot in life, their tears, their anguish, as he looked at them in the eyes, not the powerful, but the, the salt of the earth, those poor masses, as he looked at them in the eyes, their anguish, their suffering, their very real hunger, along with their hunger for a world that is set right, it's not signs that God has abandoned them. Again, in contrast to how we tend to see blessing, it's to insist that you, God is with you, and we cannot see God, we cannot find God apart from you. In the Beatitudes and throughout Jesus' ministry, then, he also makes it clear that what this means is that the needs of the poor and marginalized and the scapegoated, it's for them to be placed at the center of this, the world that we're creating, the structures that we're imagining, whether the economic structures or the social structures, the legislation we're passing, so to speak, that they should be, their needs, those who are vulnerable and marginalized, should be at the center of how we're figuring out how to make this work, what kind of world we're building. And, and inasmuch as they are not, then the mission of the church, of his followers, is to work alongside of those people and advocate for our world to be organized in such ways. It's a call to be in relationship with the poor and despised and disinherited. And then we jump from that sort of view of the world to this image that the Apostle Paul preaches to this community in Philippi, right? What kind of Jesus, what vision of Jesus are they to remember and model their own lives on? What does it mean for them to be in their right mind? What does it mean for them to clothe themselves with Christ? Well, as he goes on in this sort of what was early actually thought of as an early Christian hymn, perhaps the earliest, at least, that we still have, 
Christian hymn, perhaps put to music, we have these words of Christ who, who doesn't seek to grasp like and, and meant to sort of parallel the grasping of Adam and Eve, right? Those primordial ancestors. Jesus doesn't grasp for power. He doesn't grasp to, to be like this image of God that the world has. He pours himself out in love. Jesus didn't seek to make a name for himself, to rise in power. The name that we lift up is one who relinquished control. He modeled love all the way down, even when it cost him his life. He got on his hands and knees to serve others, even when he knew that they would betray him and deny him and flee him when he was in need. And at the end of that journey, when Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane drew his sword to strike off the ear of one of those arresting him, Jesus scolds Peter. Put your sword away, he says, because those who live by the sword will perish by the sword. I have not asked you to defend me. I have not asked you to raise arms. I have not asked you to storm anything and take it back for me. That is not the way that I am calling you to. Even when he is gathered there before Pilate on charges of essentially insurrection, of disturbing the peace, of fomenting rebellion, because this was a common thing. And there were plenty of revolutionaries at the time who were trying to foment rebellion against the Roman Empire. And so Rome brought a heavy fist down on them and their followers. This is what Jesus was accused of. This is why he was brought before Pilate. And so Pilate almost expects his followers to rise up in a sort of rebellion as he is there on trial, but he, they don't. Jesus doesn't call them to do that. But again, should we really be that surprised? Because this is just Jesus at the end of his life living out all the things that he's already been proclaiming and practicing. In fact, during his ministry, when his disciples are jockeying for positions of power and they're like, hey, can we sit at your right hand? Can we have the power? Can you give us some authority? He responds to them by saying, you know that among the Gentiles, essentially Rome, the empire, those whom they recognize as their leaders rule it over them, as their rulers lord it over them. But it is not to be so amongst you, he says. Whichever ones of you, if you wish to be great, you must become a servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must humble themselves as a servant of all. For the human one came not to be served, but to serve. Indeed, the last shall be first, and the first, those who seek after that power to control others, they shall be made last. This is a motif that is woven throughout Jesus' ministry in both actions and teachings. And then we combine that with this call to love that Jesus utters over and over again. The single greatest commandment, Jesus unequivocally says, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's not two commands, that's one. This sums up the entire law and the prophets he follows that with, which is to say everything in Scripture is fulfilled, is meant to lead to this, to love. And if it doesn't, if your actions are not in the name of love, do not bring about greater human flourishing, do not build up what they tear down, then it is not love and it is not of God, and you're doing it wrong. And just to make it clear what that looks like, again, at the height of this dramatic journey of Jesus, at the very end, as one of his final acts, on the night that he was betrayed, not only did he set a table for those who would deny and betray and desert him, but he got down on his hands and knees 
which at that time was reserved for slaves, and he washed their feet. It wasn't just a nice little symbolic act, like people had dirty, nasty feet, right? They were walking around in basic sandals or barefoot. I mean, the, trust me, some of you have been afraid to take off your shoes when we do Monday Thursday service. <laughs> Jesus got down on his feet and he, on his hands and knees, and he washed their feet, and he said, you see this? As I have loved you, you go and love others. Do likewise. This is the single commandment that I am leaving you with. Not an abstract idea. This is what it looks like. And that is what Paul is lifting up in this hymn in Philippians to this church, to this community. Don't puff yourself up like the world seeks to do, seeking after positions of power just to exert or control. The model for your lives, for how you are being called to live, is this image of Jesus, who did not lord it over people, this image is compelling precisely because it does the exact opposite. Because of this, the early church then went on to proclaim things like, as you'll see in Scripture, if you do not love your neighbor whom you can see, you cannot say you love God whom you cannot see. For God is love. And the book of James goes on to ask, what good, or, or, or question, what good is it if someone claims to have faith, but they don't have deeds? Can their faith save them? Is it any good? Suppose someone is without clothes and daily food. And if one of you says, go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed, <clears throat> thoughts and prayers, but you do nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Hint, it's not. Nothing. In the same way, faith by itself, it is, if it is not accompanied by such deeds, it is dead. I don't want it. That is the foundation that Jesus sets. That's the table that he prepares for us to eat at. For us to receive, have that wash over us, and also then to empower us to go and do likewise. That's the legacy that the early church leaves us, even as they struggled mightily to live it out. As I preach week after week, it's not that they did it great and we just got to be like them. They, they also struggled with it, oftentimes failed miserably. But that is the invitation. That is the calling. Which brings us to our present moment in this political, partisan, chaotic turmoil in which we find ourselves moving through. And this movement amidst it all called Christian nationalism. That proudly at this point calls itself Christian nationalism. We'll do more, I want to do more this fall as we move toward the election even more. Small groups, educational stuff, learning more about what is Christian nationalism. But this morning, suffice it to say that Christian nationalism is basically the idea that this country was founded by Christians, on Christian principles, for Christians, and it is the duty of Christians to maintain a distinctly Christian character as they understand it. And Christians should have and maintain a privileged place within it, especially in terms of positions of power and, you know, overseeing things. Other people can be here, non-Christians, people of other religions, but they're sort of guests at our table. It's not really theirs, and their destiny is ultimately to be determined by us what we decide, we should rule over them. 
In fact, representing this view at an event in recent years called Reawaken America, former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn said, if we are going to have one nation under God, which we must, one nation, we must have one religion, one nation and one religion under God. <clears throat> That's our former National Security Advisor. And as Representative Lauren Boebert said when speaking at a church, the church, representing that one true religion, is supposed to direct the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. Now, of course, I, th I think, I hope, we can all agree on that latter half of that statement. The government is not supposed to direct the church. We do not have a state uh, religion in this country. Thank God. But what has happened is that Christian nationalist preachers have sought to use their popular influence, that the title that they have, the reverend, the status that they have, the followers on social media and their podcasts. They've got that title of, oh, they're a Christian leader, so I can trust them. And they use that aimed at partisan political power that, again, then seek to control the population as they see fit. And as the curtain gets pulled back a bit, and again, we're going to do that this fall. We're going to learn some of this because this is not mudslinging and mischaracterizing and caricatures. We shouldn't do that kind. We, we can't play that kind of game. But when we peel back the curtain and we begin to understand the inner workings, the things that these leaders are actually saying and where it's coming from and the alliances that they're making, what we see is that it really is about control and power. And they will use whomever... <clears throat> political figure, regardless of whether or not he or she is particularly Christian, and they will use whatever means necessary to accomplish it. And that is the scary part, even if it means violence. As we saw on January 6th, just a few years ago, <clears throat> as Christians carrying that Christian flag with signs that Jesus saves stormed the Capitol building. As they beat the police <clears throat> that just before this, they were so proudly lifting up and praising the police, but when the police got in their way, it didn't matter. The badge didn't matter. They, too, lost their lives. And they got into that Senate chamber, and they held up their Bibles. They waved those flags, the Christian church flag, that one right over there, alongside that flag right over there, alongside a Confederate flag, all of these symbols mixed together, and that is the key. Conflating all of these symbols as if that equals that equals power and control. And, and I'm not even getting into the specific social or economic agenda that this movement has that its leaders have, which many of you became aware about more recently with the, the news headlines about Project 2025. They are behind a lot of that sort of agenda. All of which is to say this fervent movement that seeks to grasp for power, that seeks to lord that power over others, that is willing to enact whatever form of violence is necessary to accomplish it, well, I guess I can ask you, is it really that hard to see how far of a cry that is from Jesus, the actual person, the actual mission and ministry and message? You really got to get it twisted. And in fact, you might just focus more on worshiping this Jesus, on delineating who's in and who's out, than actually following him. And so Jesus becomes basically a prop in as much as he too is useful. Which is literally the definition of idolatry. Now too often we've heard that word idolatry as a, a, a sort of referring to any god, worship, you know, any other religion, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, atheism, anything that is not Christian is not worshiping Jesus, is idolatry. 
but I want to propose this morning that actually that's a pretty narrow and misguided representation of it. Because what we miss, again, actually in Scripture is that what Jesus insists, which is that all of Scripture is summed up in the commandment to love God by loving our neighbor, every neighbor as ourselves. You cannot love God without loving your neighbor. And loving your neighbor does not consist of controlling them, making them do something just because you believe it is the best or right way. Love doesn't seek to be the greatest. Love pours oneself out on hands and knees in service, even at great cost. It doesn't seek to be first, but stands in solidarity with those who have been made last and least. True religion, the book of James says, is to look after orphans and widows in their distress, which is James's way of saying those who have been made last and least are most vulnerable. That is what true religion looks like. And so why have Christians done so many horrible things in the name of God? Why are kings in scripture always fighting and going to war if they were really all following God? Why did they turn on occasion to worship false gods? Why is there constant fighting in the Middle East and all over the world, to be clear? Because in short, they, we, betray the calling of our faith to follow a God who wills the liberation of the oppressed as defined in that Exodus narrative, freedom from slavery in Egypt. A God who wills the building of societies where all beginning from the last and the least may flourish. Inasmuch as we, Christians, are doing those things, we are betraying the calling to follow a poor peasant preacher who dined and communed with the last and the least of this world, who bore the marks of state violence on his crucified body. Yeah, Rome did that. Before he was executed by the state who was betrayed by religious and political leaders who sought to use his execution to to sort of drum up their own support because it was popular. The crowds were chanting for it. And who through it all called us to live love out loud. That is, we betray We betray all of that for the sake of our own gain, for the sake of our own privilege, for whoever we consider to be part of our tribe. The kings chose love of power over the power of love. We choose self-advancement over service, and we will worship whatever gods will get us there, whether it's a political figure, whether it's a market, economic structure, whatever it is, we will deify it in order to make it unquestionable to serve our own ends rather than doing what Jesus actually said and called us to. And again, the way that this most often takes form is an emphasis on worshiping Jesus, being the the most important thing above actually following him. And so that question, how do we maintain and strengthen our religious freedoms given the current and future political climate? I think it is that we commit ourselves to the way that Jesus showed us. I think it's really that simple. Love. Love. Love is not easy. It's not convenient. It's not cheap. It does not come without risks. It asks something of us. You cannot love at a distance. Love gets messy and involved. Love doesn't, it it won't settle for professing beliefs 
injustice, inequity, and equality, while sitting behind a computer and staying comfortably in one's own home. Love chooses to lean into discomfort over choosing the comfort of one's own privilege, which if you think about it is fundamentally about extricating oneself from having to deal with those other realities, the injustices. We want to get to a place where we just can comfortably be separated out from it and not have to deal with it. Faith that is expressed as love doesn't seek exemptions. You know, like, what's the least amount of time that I have to give, money, resources? What's the least I need to do in order to be, like, still good? Its centering question is, how far am I willing to let love go? How far am I willing to let love take me? And so those who would proclaim that kind of love, it's not enough to be against that thing over there or to point the finger and blame someone else, whoever it might be. Those who proclaim this kind of love, who claim to follow this Jesus, it's time to get off the sidelines. It's time to stop patting ourselves on the back for being one of the good ones, on the right side of history. At this point, amidst all of the chaos and drama of our world, I don't care what you believe. Stop focusing on, here's what I believe, as a way of determining who's in and who's out and which side you're on. Believing in justice and equity, again, believing in mercy and compassion and flourishing for all without deeds, as James says, is useless. It's time that we get busy with the work of love. Yes, amen, Bennett says. It's time that we get busy, get our hands messy with the work of of love. And that is what we as a church should be all about. That's what we are here to cultivate, to build a community around, a radically inclusive community around, not just of people who think the same, but are really trying to do that work of loving each other across our differences. That's not easy to do even here amongst ourselves. But that's where we are called to start and to build that as a movement in the world, to show that it is possible. And to let that spread, just as the contagions spread. Love is infectious if we are actually willing to really give ourselves to it. And that's what I want to talk a bit more about next week as we continue this reflection, this challenge of circling around Religion, what kind of religion, Christian nationalism, this moment, this political climate that we find ourselves moving through these next couple of months. What kind of people, what kind of community are we called to be in the face of it all that refuses the hyperpartisan lines and remains committed to the work of love and justice and truth? Can we do that? We're going to try. May it be so. Amen.